the ZX Spectrum. 40 years old this year, don't you know? And as has often been mentioned, people still make games for it, really good ones, a lot of the time. A lot of these new games were available to play at the last event that I went to, Crash Live at the Bescott Stadium in Walsall, a wonderful gathering organised by the Revival folks that didn't just celebrate the computer's past, but also its present and future. While plenty of the old classics were certainly on hand to have a go on, a whole army of speckies were also full of newer games to play, the likes of Powerblade fan sequel Delta's Shadow, pretty and classic feeling platformers like Nixie the Glade Sprite, exceptional ports of classic arcades like Asteroids and Joust, some of the best from the ZX Spectrum Next, publishers like Midnight Brew and Chronosoft demonstrating and selling a lot of these new games, several of Zosa's staggering modern titles like Metal Man, Angels and Valley of Rains, and other games that have generated plenty of interest in years past, such as Castlevania Spectral Interlude. This list of games represents some of the system's best over what has been an incredibly fruitful last few years, but I think the one that really caught most people's eyes is a game that's only a couple of months old, something called TCQ, or Triangle Circle Square. The sort of game that just shows what can still be done with this humble micro all these years later if you just approach design and coding in a way that, if you'd done it back in the system's commercial life, would have probably seen you given a Manic Miner style boot directly out of the door. Let's have a look at it. Today's video is sponsored by Wireframe, the monthly magazine that doesn't just cover the latest games, but goes inside of them. It has features on great games both old and new, many an enlightening piece on the history of games and their creators, and it also encourages people to get into the art of game development themselves, with articles on how to recreate famous games, mechanics and features in engines such as Unreal in their unique toolbox section. It comes complete with beautiful, glossy artwork and opinion pieces from various key people in the industry. Oh, and me. That's what you'll find, along with a whole lot more, every month in Wireframe Magazine, the magazine that lifts the lid on video games. To subscribe, visit wfmag.cc slash kimjustice in the description, and I thank them for their support today. TCQ is the creation of a Brazilian coder by the name of Paulo Andres de Matos Vilalva, although you're probably better off searching for Amawex. If you do that, you'll find his site, his itch.io page, and all of his games. Polo has a good few games under his belt, both regular PC stuff and also a couple of games for the Mega Drive that he's worked on with another group called Manganga Team. Polo also, from what I can gather, didn't actually become aware of the Specky until 2014. This isn't necessarily someone who grew up with the system, in other words. So the historical conventions of what makes a good Spectrum game aren't necessarily something that he's aware of, and with that comes a whole new perspective. When Polo discovered the ZX Spectrum, he absolutely fell in love with one of the quirks of the system that, back in the day, was absolutely considered one of the system's biggest limitations, that being Colour Clash. If you know the Specky, you probably know all about Colour Clash. If you play any of the classics from the early mid-80s, chances are you'll find plenty of examples of it. Games like Chucky Egg, for example, or Sabre Wolf, or A Day in the Life, or something egregious like Jack and the Beanstalk. There's lots of it going about. Particularly when the 128K Specky came around in the later part of the decade, Colour Clash was really seen as something to be avoided because it made the system look weak, no matter what. Some talented artists would work around it brilliantly, you see that in games like Dan Dare, or Cobra, or Rex. Others would put big borders around their sprites in order to protect them from the clash, that's a trademark of the works of David Perry and Nick Bruti. Others still don't seem to care too much about the clash at all, it's kind of a hallmark of the Oliver Twins Dizzy games that they're absolutely chock full of clash, and clearly, they didn't give a toss. Perhaps they liked it too, and the game sold regardless. But the most common method of avoiding colour clash was to strip the system of its colour entirely. Games became monochrome. Was this a good thing? Well, they thought it was at the time. Better to have just one colour than to have any clash at all. Some, however, might think it makes games look a little soulless, in all honesty, particularly these days. 
Back in the day, decisions like this were taken from much more of a commercial standpoint. Nowadays, that's not really an issue. So if someone like Paolo loves the idea of colour clash, of what happens when all these different hues come together like paints on a palette, he can embrace it without any inhibition. And that's exactly what he's done with his specy games. His first one was a demake of Dev Will 2, a game that he originally released for PC, and there's also a Mega Drive version of. You play as this cute little devil, and in something of a Metroid style, you go around the map obtaining various abilities such as sliding and double jumping. The graphics are wonderful, and you can see how Paolo likes to use Colour Clash here already. You can also see some of the more unconventional traits of his games. He really likes repetition on these flick screen games, throwing quite similar screens out at you in a way that's just enough to keep you a bit disoriented without things actually getting samey. It's quite interesting. His second specy game is another one he'd already done. Virgil's Purgatory was originally made for the Game Boy, and this specy version takes things up a couple more notches, with wonderful graphics and an aesthetic that's based off of the Divine Comedy. You chuck your head at monsters, decap attack style, and once again you have a big map to go through with different areas and appropriately different music for each area. The Metroidvania is quite strong in this one, and the specky MSX version of Virgil's Purgatory was given some rave reviews when it came out last year. And now we get to TCQ. Triangle Circle Square, released a couple of months ago, is Paulo's first entirely original game for the ZX Spectrum and MSX platforms, and this is very much the game where the guy's love for colour clash is really driven to something of a logical conclusion. As the name might suggest, this game is all about geometric shapes. In the description and post-mortem of the game, Paulo breaks down some of the inspirations behind this game's aesthetic, and they're quite highbrow indeed. He and a friend named Louis Souza had a concept in place where the game would not be just inspired by the work of the Russian abstract painter Vasily Kandinsky, but that the game would be created by the artist himself, or rather this fictional version of Kandinsky who died in obscurity as a junkie in the 1980s. It appears as though an emulation of Kandinsky's style was unfortunately a bit tricky to do on the humble specy, and therefore Paolo looked for inspiration in the works of another abstract artist, the modernist Piet Mondrian, founder of the Distigi or Lee Style movement. The man who took the concept of abstraction and reduced it to no more than the three primary colours and simple geometric shapes. The guy who doesn't just get inches in the papers nowadays when one of his works sells for a phenomenal amount of money, as they do, but also when it's discovered that one of his famed pieces, New York City One, has been hanging upside down in galleries around the world for 75 years. And hey, the ZX Spectrum can certainly do geometric shapes fine enough, so if you want a computer to fix up a Mondrian-inspired game on, well, the specy is certainly up to the job. As you might expect from all the build-up, the game itself is this quite artsy looking platformer with pretty straightforward controls. O and P move left and right, and Q performs various actions depending on what shape you are. You change shape by hitting the various icons as you come across them. The circle is the only shape that can jump, and the triangle is the only shape that can fire a laser, useful for killing enemies and getting rid of barriers in your way. The square doesn't have any triggered ability, but it can dissolve weaker platforms as it moves across them, opening up new areas in the level. The live situation is pretty straightforward. You have infinite, and you'll start at the beginning of a screen if you die. This is all very indie platformy, and I suppose if you were looking for a relation to this game, you would find it in Mike Biffell's excellent Thomas Was Alone, another game that immerses itself in geometric shapes, and also got quite a few comparisons to the work of Mondrian when it was released back in 2012. This has a rougher, distinctly specky sort of vibe though, and certainly no Danny Wallace narration. Instead there's a fine and pumping AY soundtrack courtesy of Sergei Nylov, who even provides a version of the legendary No Limit by 2 Unlimited for the game's scrolling stages. The game itself is on the short side. 
Once you learn the game, you can probably blitz through it in around about 15 minutes, but it's certainly a cool enough experience that you may well want to repeat it, not just to try and see if you can finish it with as few deaths as possible, but also to have a proper look at what's going on when it comes to how Paolo has played around and designed these levels. It does contain some of those elements that you'll find in the previous games. Here though, the art of using repetition tends to come via returning to a screen as a different shape and having to play through the screen totally differently, which requires its own workings out in terms of design. And the way that he's used colour clash is quite a joy to see. He's not just chucked it about in a random fashion, but he's used it to do things like play with light and shadow, or simulate scrolling effects, or to give the impression of stage as being very layered indeed in ways that you don't really get on the specy. To the game's credit, it's not something that you really get completely lost in despite the nature of these graphics. A fair bit of care and precision has gone into creating this little world, and it's lovely to see. It is quite something to have a game like this, it has to be said. After 40 years, the ZX Spectrum can still surprise you. And it can surprise you in a way that doesn't require upgrades, or things that you simply wouldn't be able to do on a regular specy in its heyday. From a tech perspective, TCQ is not exactly reinventing the wheel. It's created using Jonathan Caldwell's multi-platform arcade game designer, the latest version of a very easily accessible tool that has been used to make absolutely no end of games over the years, particularly platformers. What the game has done, simply, is to reverse an equation. It's taken something that was at one point considered the ZX Spectrum's greatest flaw, and treated that as if it's the system's greatest strength. It's all gone in an entirely different direction, and the result is this very striking title that is absolutely worth the recommendation, whether it's on here or on the MSX version, which is basically the same. The price of admission is perfectly fine too. If you go to the game's itch.io page, then you can pay what you want for a download of the tape image for playing in your emulator of choice, with the default being a couple of quid. Thoroughly fair. There is also a physical release of the game available to buy on the Technamic website, although at the time of this video that's currently sold out. And hey, you can even download and fiddle around with the source code in MPAGD, if that's your bag. I love this game, and I presume that it will be right up there when the bods at magazines like Fusion and what have you consider what the best new Spectrum games of 2022 are, and I hope that it achieves even more attention beyond the specy scene. Things might be a bit different if that happens, mind you. I do think that when the likes of Castlevania Spectral Interlude got a fair bit of attention a few years back, it was the sort of thing that was treated as a bit of a flash in the pan, this weird little one-off. But really, nowadays, the quality of new Spectrum games, and the regularity of which these games are released, is becoming something that's harder to ignore, and gathering more and more steam. It's why an event like Crash Live could feel thoroughly comfortable in putting tons of new games on display, as opposed to focusing solely on the classics. And why names from the past, like Crash and Zap64, have now been resurrected under the Fusion Retrobooks branding. The Specky's colours are, in the end, as bright and as clashy and as garish as they've ever been. Hopefully you've enjoyed this little look at an excellent new game, but until the next time, bye for now.